Okay, so my clock says it's time to get started. It looks like we've got a number of people in the room. Uh, just a little bit about what we're here for. Um, I'm going to be talking about task and await in C Sharp. And specifically, we're going to spend most of our time in code. And we're going to look at um, calling an asynchronous method, doing something with the results after it returns, and also looking at what happens if we get exceptions during that asynchronous call, how do we handle those? So this is something that took me a while. <laughs> um, Task came out with .NET 4.0. I've actually been doing .NET for a while since 2005 with .NET 2.0, so it's been a while. So Task came out, and when it first came out, I'm like, this is really important. But I started looking at it, and I said, you know what? This is way too complicated. So this is going to have to wait till later. And then with .NET 4.5, we got async await. And I was like, oh, well, this is interesting. <laughs> um, and then you know, it ended up in some of the templates in Visual Studio kind of sprinkled through the code. I'm like, well, I should understand this. And then I started looking at it. And I'm like, well, I don't really know what's going on here. So I'm going to copy and paste and cross my fingers and hope it works. And that's not a great way to program. Well, I found out that underneath await is task. And so I said, OK, let's go back and figure this out. It was kind of daunting, as we'll see when we start looking at some code. But what I found is you don't have to know everything about it. If you learn you know, a handful of things, you can actually be productive with it and understand what await is doing. And then as long as await does what you need, great, use it. That's why it's there. But if you need to step outside of that box, now you have the tools to do something else. So that's really what we're shooting for today. Uh, my website is jeremybytes.com. And if you head out there, you will find slides and code samples and a YouTube series and some other things that I do not have time to talk about today. And if you scroll up to the very top of the chat, you'll find a direct link to the resources for this talk. So let's go ahead and get started here. So um, like I said, I've been doing .NET for a while. And there's been a number of asynchronous patterns that have come through, including the asynchronous programming model, or APM, the event asynchronous pattern, or EAP. And today, we live in the world with the task asynchronous pattern, or TAP. And we got to have the little three-letter acronyms for everything, because we're programmers. The asynchronous programming model, this is kind of where I started, because um, you know, these patterns actually make it so we don't have to do manual threading. Whenever I tried to do manual threading or one of my coworkers did manual threading, we always ended up with interesting race conditions. And, and managing threads yourself is never a fun thing. So I did that very rarely and usually used one of these patterns. Now, the asynchronous programming model was method-based. And generally, you had a pair of methods. You had a begin something something and an end something something. And the trick to it was the begin method returned an iAsync result. And then you would pass that iAsync result as a parameter to the end. And I had to look up how to do this every single time. <laughs> so it wasn't very intuitive to work with. It was difficult. And it, you know, it was, it had a lot of quirks. So then um, you know, again, the language designers are always coming up with you know better ways of, of approaching things. And so kind of the next thing that came around was the event asynchronous pattern. And based on the name, you might guess this is event-based. And the good thing is uh, hooking up an event handler is like one of the first things we learn, or I should say second thing, right? First is console.write, hello world. Second thing is button.click, right? If you do any kind of UI. So this was event-based, and so there would be a method such as get data async in this case. And then when that and that would kick off an asynchronous process, when it was done, an event would fire. And then you just have to hook up your own event handler. And then if there is some kind of return value coming back from that, there it would be in the custom event args for that. So pretty easy to work with because it was a very familiar construct, especially in my world where I was doing desktop programming. But it did have some limitations. Because what if something went wrong with the process? Well, basically, if something went wrong, the event would never fire. So you kind of lost visibility to everything. So even though it was easy, if things went wrong, it was really difficult to even just know something went wrong. So again, challenges were there. 
And then, um, you know, again, the language designer is saying, okay, let's come up with something a little more robust. And that's where we are today with the task asynchronous pattern. As you might guess from its name, this is task-based. And generally what we have is we have a method that returns a task. And this ta it'll re either return a task or a task of T with a generic type. Now, if it does return a generic type, then whatever that type is, that's a payload that's coming back. So if I have a task of string, that means that once this asynchronous process is done, I'm going to have a string. And so what a task actually is, it's something that represents a concurrent operation. And a concurrent operation just means more than one thing happening at the same time. Some of the things I like about this is I don't have to worry about threading <laughs> because um, the, compile, the people who built the compiler are way smarter at that kind of thing than I am. I build business applications, right? That's my experience. Now, when you have a task, it may or may not happen on a separate thread. There might be no thread resources consumed for a task. But you know what? That's not my job to figure out. That's the compiler's job to figure out. So I really like that. And then the thing about task is they're extremely flexible, extremely powerful. So you can have a task, and when it's done, it kicks off another task. When it's done, it kicks off another task. When it's done, it kicks off another task. Or you can have a task that kicks off five child tasks that all run at the same time. And then once all those are done, we can do something else. So it's extremely flexible, extremely powerful. Now, unfortunately, with great power comes great complexity. <laughs> and so again, that's kind of where I got stuck the first time that I approached a task. So um, let's do code because that's enough slides. I like water slides. I don't really like PowerPoint slides. So I'm going to flip over to Visual Studio and show you this application that, um, that uh, we're going to use today. Let me just zoom in on the solution to look at the projects. This has four projects. The top one is a people.service. So this is actually a web service that will provide us with data. And um, that's an a all of this is uh, .NET Core 3.1. So that's an ASP.NET MVC web API service, long name. <laughs> The next one down, using task.library, this is a class library that has the asynchronous method that we will be calling. The bottom one, uh, bottom project uh, using task.ui, this is a WPF desktop application, and this is the, app, the part of the code that will call that asynchronous process. And then in the middle, we have using task.shared, and this is a shared library that, you know, it has things like the data type we're using and things like that. OK, so let me just, uh, first thing I'm going to do is start the service. And this is a .NET Core service. So I like to start these from the command line outside Visual Studio so I don't have to wait for them. Just as a little tip, there's this really cool um, thing you can get called Power Commands. And this is available for free in the Visual Studio Marketplace. So if you go to the extensions in Visual Studio, you can search for this. And what I like about this is I can right click on this people.service project, go to power commands and say open command prompt. And it's going to open a developer command prompt at that location. Now, uh, this is a little bit small, but um, uh, actually, you know what? All I'm going to type here is .NET run to kick off the service. Uh, what's actually on this screen isn't important. So I'm going to type .NET run. The service is going to fire up. And then this is just where we're going to get our data from. So this is going to be running while we continue. OK, so like I mentioned, there's two files that we'll be working with. And one of them is in the library project. And uh, let me collapse some things here so we can focus. <laughs> And in the library project, we have a class called Person Reader. And this class is responsible for making a call to that service that we just started. And then it's going to give us back a collection of person objects. Now, if I look at what a person is, let me just peek at this. This is basically the shape of our data. So it has six properties, an ID, a given name, a family name, a start date, a rating, and a format string. 
And then it has an override of the two string method that actually uses the format string. So if we look at this get async method, we'll see that it returns a task of list of person. OK, so this returns a task. And then you'll notice that the generic type on that is list of person. So first thing that you'll get used to with task is sometimes you have nested generic types. <laughs> so what this is saying is when this is complete, I will have a list of person objects, assuming everything goes well. We're not going to look specifically at um, the details of this method. I just want to point out what's on line 25 because um, I want to show um, how that the asynchronous code is actually working. So I need a little bit of an artificial delay in my code. So on line 25, I have a task.delay3000. And if you've ever used a thread.sleep, this is, has the similar functionality, but you don't have to feel quite as bad using it. So when we do a thread.sleep, what happens is uh, you know, thread.sleep3000 will stop the operation of the method for three seconds. Sometimes we put it in there because I don't know what's wrong, but if I wait three seconds, it works. Generally, if we have to put something in, um, there's probably a bigger problem going on. But what thread.sleep does is it actually does a while loop and just goes bzzz in a while loop for that three seconds, and it blocks the current thread. Now, task.delay does the same thing. So in this case, if I await it, it will pause for three seconds, but it does not consume any thread resources. So that means even though if I have to put an artificial delay in my application, again, it's probably a signal that something else is wrong. <laughs> but uh, in this case, I'm not consuming thread resources, so I don't have to feel quite as bad about using it. In this case, it's completely artificial so that we can see the gap between the time we call the method and the time it comes back. So this is what we're going to be using. Now, I do have a UI application. Let me just go ahead and run this. So you can see my amazing UI development skills. Um, for anyone who was in my dependency injection workshop yesterday, this will look familiar. Pretty much all my demo applications are similar so that I don't get confused. And what we have is we have three buttons on the left-hand side. So we have a fetch, um, a fetch data with task button, a fetch data with a wait button, and a cancel button. And then on the right-hand side, we have a list box, and that's where we'll put our data. If I go to the code behind of the form, what I have are some empty button click event handlers. So we're going to fill these in. I Generally, when I'm doing a desktop application, I don't put my code in the code behind, but I want to focus on task. So we're going to kind of do this as um, uh, with as little code as possible so we can focus on the confusing bits. Now, I, I am using a desktop application. And one of the reasons I'm using a desktop application is it will be really easy to see that something is happening on a separate thread. Now, I know desktop applications aren't very common today. And you might say, well, I'm in the web world. Why do I care? <laughs> this is actually almost more important in the web world because what happens is when you when someone makes a request to your server, there's actually a limited number of threads that are available to handle incoming requests. So if you if someone comes in and you just leave them on that request thread, well, you're going to reduce the number of people that can actively connect to your server. But if you if someone makes a request and you say, oh, well, I'm going to make an a task or an async call somewhere else, maybe I need to get data from a database or, an, or a service. In that situation, you get off of that request thread, which frees it up for other people to join. <laughs> and then uh, you can continue processing from there. So this is actually more important in the web world, getting off your primary thread. But um, it's kind of hard to demonstrate. So that's why we're using a desktop application. OK, so at the top of my class, I'm going to create a variable for this person reader object that we just looked at. So we'll call this reader, and we'll just new up a person reader. And then we'll start with task. So um, I'm, I have uh, down on line 35, you'll notice I have a clear list box method. And this just clears out the list box that we have in the UI. I'm going to call that at the top of every method just so I have something fresh. And then I want to call the reader.getAsync method. 
Now, there's a lot of times where I'm calling library code that I don't necessarily have direct access to the code. And so I might be like, well, I'm not exactly sure what type this returns. And I found that there's a way that you can have Visual Studio help you out. And that's with the var keyword. So if I say var result equals, var is strongly typed. It's just the compiler can figure it out. So what that means is if I come here and hover over var, it'll tell me the result that's coming back from this method. So on the top, we can see this is a task of t result. And then down at the bottom, we can see t result is a list of person. So this is telling me this returns a task of list of person. OK, let's be explicit about that just so we get as little confused as possible today. And I'll go ahead and change the name to people task since that's what it is. So that's a little tip that I use um, kind of frequently. Why do I have red squigglies? Oh, because uh, I typed this wrong. Task of list of person. There we go. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> OK, that worries me. OK. So what this will do is it will call that get async method, which will kick off that method, and it will give us a task back. OK, what do we do with the task? Well, there's something that's really tempting, because the task that we get back actually has, come on, you can do it. There we go. It has a property called result. And if we look at what result is, this is a list of person. So this is the thing that I'm trying to get out of this asynchronous method. So it's really tempting for me to just say, OK, um, I'm going to use that right here, right? Put it into my list box, whatever I'm going to do with it. But there's a problem with this. Because if you try to access the result property before it's populated, it will block your current thread. And basically, that would kill any asynchrony that we had in this particular method. Now, it gets a little worse in this case since I'm in a UI application. Because if I try to use dot result inside this button click event handler, I'm going to end up with a deadlock. Because what happens is since I'm on the UI thread, the UI thread is waiting for this um, separate task thread to complete. And the task thread is waiting for the UI thread to say it's OK to give it data back. And so it ends up with a deadlock. So if you try to do it here, bad things happen. So um, don't do that, as tempting as it is. OK, great. Um, what should we do instead? Well, instead of doing this, what we want to do is set up what's known as a continuation. And what that means is, hey, once this task is done, I would like you to continue by doing something else. And on a task, there is a continue with method. And this is where we get some good news and bad news. Um, OK, we get mostly bad news. <laughs> and this is one of the stopping points I had kind of early in my process of looking in this. Because I said, OK, I need to set up a continuation. Let me look at this method. And then what I see is that this one method has 40 overloads. 40 overloads. And that's when I say, you know what? I don't have time for this right now. I'm going to go do something else. So. Um, that's the first thing to get over. But you know, at some point, I say, hey, you know what? Um, a lot of times when there's a lot of overloads or any overloads, the most commonly used one is the first one. OK, great. Let's look at the parameter for this first overload. And I look at it, and it says the parameter I need is an action of task of list of person. Action of task of list of person. OK, yeah, I don't have time for this, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, what does that even mean? Well, another topic that I talk about, and if you go to my website, you can find some resources on it, are delegates. And delegates are um, a way that we can actually pass methods around as parameters to other methods, which is exactly what we want to do here. Now, action is a built-in delegate type. And the an action will return void. OK, so there's no return value. And then for its parameters, whatever it's are in the generic type uh, angle brackets, that's what the parameter for the method is. So what this means is I need a method that returns void and takes a task of list of person as a parameter. And again, if you want to get more comfortable with delegates, I got information out there.
OK, let me write that method. Private void, we'll call it populate list box, because that's really what I'm trying to do. And this will take a task of list of person as a parameter, which I'll call task here. And then I can take this method name and paste it in there. And the red squigglies go away. I'm, I, I don't like red squigglies. They make me very uncomfortable. OK, so now I have this separate method. What do I do? Well, I'm going to immediately use task.result. <laughs> now, I know I just told you don't use task.result, <laughs> but it's actually OK here, because this uh, populate list box method will only run after the task is done, is completed. So that means result will be populated, assuming something bad didn't happen. So assuming a success state, result will be populated. So I don't have to worry about blocking threads when I check the result here. Now, result, again, is a list of person. Just to make the code a little more readable, I'm going to create a local variable called people and just assign that so that my code is a little more approachable. OK, now that I have this, I'm going to for each over it. So for each person in people, and then put each one into the list box. Uh, person list box, uh, person list box, the items dot add person, just like that. OK, so I'm calling the asynchronous method, getting a task back. I have a continuation set up on that method. And then I'm using the result to populate a list box. Let's see the amazing stuff happen. OK, so uh, build started. <laughs> and, uh, so the fun thing is um, visual something in Visual Studio broke one of my projects yesterday, which meant I had to upgrade to the latest version of Visual Studio last night. So that means that it's doing that whole metrics thing that it does when you get a new version of Visual Studio. So my computer's feeling a little bad today. <laughs> OK, anyway, so here's our application. Let's click our button. We'll wait our three seconds, and then something amazing will happen. Do, 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 oh, OK, the amazing thing that happened is we get an exception. And for anyone who's done desktop programming and has done multi-threading on desktop programming, you will recognize this error. <laughs> so this is an invalid operation exception. And it says the calling thread cannot access this object because a different thread owns it. Now, what this is saying is you are trying to access a UI element from not the UI thread. Uh, yeah, and in this case, we're trying to put something into the list box. OK, so from my days of manual threading, I, I kind of remember that you can do this thing where you um, uh, use a dispatcher.invoke to marshal back to the UI thread. And you know what? I, I don't want to deal with that. Well, fortunately for us, you don't have we don't have to. Huh, I won't say you don't have to, we don't have to. And that is because we can use one of the other overloads that's on this continue with. And um, you know, I'm feeling I'm kind of feeling number eight today. So let's look at number eight. Um, yeah, that's not luck. I've done this a lot of times. <laughs> so for overload number eight, and subject to change order at any time without notice, in addition to the action of task parameter that we have, there's another parameter, which is a task scheduler. Now, the task scheduler is the thing that's responsible for taking care of tasks. So it, it looks at a task and says, OK, is, is this ready to run? Do I have to wait for something else to happen before I run it? OK, where am I going to run it? Um, am I going to? Uh, does it want to run somewhere specific? Can I just grab a thread from the thread pool? And so the task scheduler is responsible for taking care of all of that orchestration. Now, basically, what I want to do is I want to tell the task scheduler, I want this continuation to run on the UI thread. And there's a very intuitive method name that you can call. It's actually a static method on the task scheduler class, which is from current synchronization context. Now, it should be very clear from the name exactly what that's doing, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> OK, so from current synchronization context is saying, I would like you to run this continuation within the same context as you are right now when you're doing the assignment of the continue with. Um, I think Microsoft could have done a little bit better with the naming of this. So the gist of it is, OK, what's my context for where I'm calling the continue with method? Well, I'm inside a button click event handler, which is running on the UI thread. So that means when I say from current synchronization context, please run the continuation 
back on the UI thread. Okay, let's see what happens now. Okay, so we'll build and run our application. And I'll take some water while we're waiting. And we click the button, we wait our three seconds, and data! Okay, the screen share is catching up. There's data, okay. <laughs> Screen sharing makes this so much less dramatic. Okay, so, um, but is it asynchronous? Okay, this is probably not going to come across on the screen share, but for those in, of you in the room who have done Windows programming, this is going to impress you because I'm going to click the button and I'm going to move the application. Let me do that again. It's kind of It's kind of jaggy on the screen share. Click the button and move the application so I can move it freely. I can resize it. It's actually not going into a not responding state. <laughs> so any desktop developers will be very impressed by that. But what that shows is we are actually running this process on a separate thread. The UI is not blocked, so I can still interact with it. So that's really cool. OK, before we leave task, I want to do one more thing. And that is I want to change this to the way the cool kids are doing it. So this code works. It's perfectly valid. And if you would like to do it this way, you're welcome to. But here's the thing. You won't find any online samples that look like this. Why? Because it doesn't, um, it doesn't use a Lambda expression, right? All the cool kids use Lambda expressions. So um, here's... Uh, uh, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to say, okay, you know what? I'm I'm going to take this delegate that I have. Again, action is a delegate. And I'm going to turn it into a Lambda expression. Uh, and basically, the way we're using a Lambda expression in this case is as an anonymous delegate. Um, so let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, and before I do that, let me just answer a quick question. I see Marty has a question. How would you use continue with in a web request? And I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about um, await. So I'll say, hang on, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the impl implications of that. Okay, so right now I have what's known as a named delegate. And the name happens to be the method name populate list box. But I can turn this into an anonymous delegate by highlighting the parameters and method body, and I'm going to control C to paste that to my clipboard. I'm going to come up to this populate list box, remove it, type in the delegate keyword, and then paste. And so what I've done is inline that code, and I can actually delete the separate method that we have. Okay, so I've just inlined that code and created what's known as an anonymous delegate, which is a delegate without a name. That's the official definition. <laughs> and again, it's basically just inline code. Now, to turn this anonymous delegate into a Lambda expression, what I do is I delete the delegate keyword, and I add that equals greater than sign, the Lambda operator, between the parameters and the method body. Now I have a Lambda expression. Now, I realize this doesn't look much like a Lambda expression because it is way too readable. <laughs> Um, Lambda expressions have a lot of syntactic sugar <laughs> to make them very compact. I actually have a separate presentation that I do about Lambda expressions. So again, you can check out my website and find resources for that. Now, Lambda expressions with a syntactic sugar, they have something that's known as parameter type inference. And parameter type inference is a good phrase to know because when you say it in front of your boss, you sound really smart. But what it means is if the compiler can figure out the type of the parameter for my Lambda expression, I don't have to type it in. So I don't actually have to type in this task of list a person. I can just put in task, the name of my parameter. And if I hover over this, it's still the same thing. It's still a task of list a person. How does the compiler know that? Well, remember when we looked at the parameters and it says, hey, you got to give me an action of task of list a person here? Well, it knows that that means it's a method with one parameter, which is of type task of list a person. So the compiler knows we don't have to type it. Another thing is that if we have a single parameter in a Lambda expression, we don't need parentheses around it. And then as a convention, people often use single character parameter names. Um, when we're doing link, then it's very common because we want things really, really small. In this case, I'm just going to keep it as task because I don't want to make it too unreadable. Now again, doing the separate named delegate that we had before, that works. And we'll have the same results in this situation. 
So that's a legitimate way of doing it. But again, the examples you see online are going to be using Lambda expressions. So you should get comfortable with them even if you're not planning on using them yourself. Okay, and this operates the same way. I know we've known each other for all of 30 minutes now, but I'll run it again just to show that I'm I'm not making things up. Okay, so I click the button and move the screen. And then, okay, that really didn't come out on the screen share, but you'll have to trust me a little bit. It's way more impressive when we don't have uh, software and thousands of miles of internet in between, <laughs> okay? So here's the thing. When we're looking at task, this is not a, a beginning level C-sharp developer thing, right? Um, basically, you have to be comfortable with generic types. You have to be comfortable with nested generic types. You have to understand delegates. And then um, what is this whole from current synchronization context, right? So it's not very approachable. And again, this is one of the reasons why I stayed so far away from this for so long. Now, fortunately for us, the language designers of C-sharp actually do a lot of really awesome things. I can't say I agree with everything they do, but they do a lot of awesome things. And so after Task came out, basically someone, uh, go back to the code for a second, basically somebody looked at this situation and said, you know what? People do this 99% of the time. Okay, maybe 95% of the time. What is it? I call an asynchronous process, I wait for it to finish, I get the result, and then I do something with the result. Okay, that's what most people are doing. We're not doing any of those other, you know, 40 overloads and chaining things together. I mean, we can, but most of the time it's like, you know what, get me data from this service, right? Call this database. It's something like that. It's just kind of a one-shot thing. And so this is kind of complicated for that. So the language designer said with .NET 4.5, hey, we can make this easier. And that's where we got async await. Now, when we look at async and await, this is really a syntactic wrapper around task. So the tasks still exist. So we're still going to have tasks in our asynchronous method that we're calling. But in our calling code, we're not going to see those tasks. They're going to be hidden behind this facade of async await. Now, what happens is when we hit the await uh, keyword, uh, this is going to pause. Or I'm sorry, it's the await operator. I, I got to get my terminology correct. It's actually not a keyword. It's an operator. So when we get to the await operator, what it will do is it will pause and wait for whatever's um, whatever method we're calling to finish before continuing in the method. So what happens is we have code that looks like normal single-threaded code that we're used to building, but it's kind of secretly multi-threaded on the backside. And so when we look at the code, it's going to look like a blocking operation saying, oh, well, this is waiting for this to come back. So of course, it's going to block the thread and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't block it. And so that's really the important part of this. The nice thing about it is that we write code that looks very familiar to us. And we don't have to worry about all of this other, um, all of these other details in order to do this one thing. Now, when we look at async, async is a modifier. And this is really just a hint. So it, especially when you first see this, it's very tempting to say, oh, well, if I put async on my method, it's going to be magically asynchronous. And that is not the case. Async is just a hint to the compiler that says, um, if you see a wait inside this block, treat it this special way. And the reason this exists is because a wait was not a reserved word in C sharp. So it's possible maybe not very likely, that you've already used await as an identifier in your code, for example. So rather than potentially breaking existing code, the language designer said, OK, we're going to put this modifier in. So if you mark this method with the async modifier, anytime I see await inside this block of code, I'm going to treat it this special way. OK, so let's do this same thing using await. And I've got this handy button right here. So again, we'll start by clearing the list box. And then I'm going to do the same thing I did before, var result equals reader dot get async. And then this time I'm going to hover over the get async method. And Visual Studio tells me in parentheses right at the beginning that this is awaitable. 
So it's directly telling me you can await this. Okay, cool. So I can add the await and then I'll get red squigglies. It's gonna yell at me because it's going to say, you know what, you need to mark this as async, otherwise it's not going to work. Now, I do wanna give you a little bit of warning with the pop-up help that says, oh, we'll add the async for you. This will want to rename your method and maybe change the return type. Now, I don't have time to talk about why async void is a bad idea and you should avoid it, um, but the one, <laughs> or I'll say, yeah, one of the few exceptions to async void is a bad idea is in an event handler in a UI. So async void is okay here. So, and I don't want to rename the method to underscore click async because that's going to break the um, event handler hookup to the button that I have in place right now. So I'll just mark this as async. And now what is this result? Well, this tells me it's a list of T and T is a person. So this is a list of person. Okay, let's call this people. Okay, now, now what? Well, I have this list of person. Let's for each over it and see what happens. For each person in people, person list box dot items dot add person. Okay, based on what I had to do before, this really does not feel like enough code. So um, let's just see what happens. Okay, so we'll click on our button and then wait the three seconds and wait for the screen share to catch up. <laughs> I have data. So that actually worked. That doesn't feel right. Is it asynchronous? Well, I'll be able to tell you might not on the screen share, but I can click the button and move the screen around. Okay, that worked a little bit. Come on, there we go. So yes, it is asynchronous. And that's cool. I like that code so much more uh, than what I wrote earlier because <laughs> this is actually approachable. Now, you'll notice that I didn't have to do anything about this from current synchronization context stuff. And that's because await defaults the other way. So basically the reason why we need that from current synchronization context when we're dealing with tasks has to do with the task scheduler because the task scheduler says, okay, well, I need to run this task and you know what? I need a thread from the thread pool to do that. So I'm gonna grab a thread from the thread pool, run the task. Okay, I have this continuation and I need to run that somewhere. Well, you know what? I've already got this thread that I was just using. So I'm gonna keep running it here. Whereas when we say from current synchronization context, it's gonna say, oh, uh, yeah, I need to go back here before I run the continuation. So the default behavior when we use tasks directly is use whatever thread is handy. Now that makes a lot less sense in the await world because if I have my little method here, right? I wouldn't expect line 35 and line 37 to run on separate threads, right? So just from a logical standpoint, I kind of expect the clear list box and the for each to be running on the same thread because that's what happens when we write normal code where we're not dealing with asynchronous methods. So the language designer said await is going to default the other way. So when you use await, it's going to default to go back to the current synchronization context. Now there's, um, okay, so quick question from Aaron. He says, so in this example, get async is returning a task and the await keyword unwraps it to its type. And yes, that's kind of a high level way of thinking about this. When we use await, we're gonna get that result, whatever the task of T type is, we'll get that T out of it. Now, what's actually happening in the background is the compiler's building a state machine. And I'm totally not gonna talk about that. But yes, you can think about await as removing the task part and just giving us the payload that's coming back. So yes, logically, that's exactly what's happening. Okay, now for those of you who build library programming or have done things um, maybe with websites, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, if you have a, a task, uh, uh, a method that returns a task, you really should use dot configure await false. Use configure await false, because this is a good idea. What does that mean? <laughs> 
Well, what configure await false means is it in this case, since we're awaiting it, it means don't go back to the prior thread. So if we use, if we await uh, the get async and say configure await false, basically line 35 and the right half of line 36 will run on one thread. <laughs> and then the other part where we assign to the people on line 36 and the rest of the method will run on a separate thread. And that is exactly what we don't want in this particular application, but I'll do this so that we can see the result. Okay, so we'll run it again, and then we'll click on the button. And then after three seconds, we'll see the same exception we got initially with task. And that is the invalid operation exception because we're trying to access the list box, a UI element from not the UI thread. So when we use configure await false, what we're saying is, uh, I don't care what thread you're using for this. And so generally when we're doing library code, configure await false, um, it actually is um, an optimization because it doesn't have to grab the current context. It doesn't have to marshal back to it when it's done. So using configure await false, where you say, I don't care what thread you're on, does have some performance um, uh, improvements um, because of that. So that's why you'll hear that advice. Now you can see in this situation, it's exactly the wrong thing to do because we do need to get back to the calling thread. Now back to, um, oh, I forgot. I forgot who asked it. I'm gonna have to scroll in my chat. Okay, sorry, delay. Uh, okay, back to Marty's question about web stuff, <laughs> right? So it's very common to have um, asynchronous code in the web world, again, because we don't want to block those request threads. And so a lot of times we'll have the configure await false setup when we're awaiting, and then we're not really worrying about where things are, are running. And that depends on the situation. Now, just as a warning, I have, um, you can actually run into problems if you're using some more I'll say legacy type of web programming. So for example, if you store things in the session uh, and you need access to that, that is associated with a thread. So if you need something on the session, don't use configure wait falls because you want to go back there so you have access to the session. So um, that's just as a warning. So even though um, it's kind of the common advice out there, it's good to understand what it means. Configure wait false means I don't care what thread you're using. Uh, otherwise, again, the default is, hey, go back to where you were with a wait. Does that make sense? And I don't know if that kind of answered your question, Marty. Is it close enough? <laughs> um, quite honestly, you're more likely to use async await for the types of things that we're doing both in desktop applications and websites and mobile applications. Because a lot, again, a lot of times what we're saying is, hey, go get me this data from this resource without blocking a thread. And if we need to step outside that for parallel code, well, that's another topic. <laughs> OK. So um, our application looks pretty good so far. It does have a little bit of a problem, though, because I'm not blocking the UI. <laughs> so if I run the application and then click on uh, the Fetch with a Wait button, I can click it multiple times. And then what happens is I get multiple result sets back. And you might say, Jeremy, you're not clearing the list box. Well, yeah, that's the first thing we did. We clear the list box at the top of the method. But what happens each time I click the button is it goes clear, clear, clear. And then three seconds later, the data starts coming back. I get data, data, data. So really um, what we want to do is um, you might say, well, I've actually had long discussions on where we clear the list box. The answer is don't clear the list box. Instead, I'm going to disable the UI. So I have a fetch with a wait button. I'm going to set its is enabled process to false. And then down here at the bottom, I'm going to set it to true. And now when we run the application, um, hopefully we'll, we'll see how this comes across the screen share. Uh, click on the button. And now it's disabled. So I can't click it again while the data is there. And then once the data comes back, the button re-enables. Now you might say, okay, what happens if we get an exception somewhere in between? I, I want this button to re-enable. Well, with await, we code the way we're used to, so I can put this in a try finally block. Now I love Visual Studio code snippets, so I'm gonna highlight this block of code and use Control-K, Control-S as a keyboard shortcut. 
that will bring me back my, um, it'll say surround with snippet. So these are snippets that have the concept of a body to them. I type in try F for a finally, or try finally. I hit enter, it takes that block of code, wraps it in a try statement, gives me a finally block, and puts my cursor in the finally block. Lazy developer for the win. <sighs> OK. So <laughs> I love code snippets in Visual Studio. OK. So um, in this situation, now if it does throw an exception somewhere along the way, the button will still get re-enabled. Um, so Andre says, I thought we would cancel the previous request. And I would say, no. Um, since in this case, I know this, the data is going to the data doesn't change at all. But <laughs> assuming even the data did change, I actually want to prevent the user from making multiple uh, requests to the service because they only need one. So make that first request, and then hey, you can't make another one until this is done. <laughs> okay, the task button has the same problem. So let's just run through this. So the fetch with task button is enabled equals false, and then down at the bottom. We'll set it back to true. Now, when we run the application, come on, faster. You can do it. I think my computer is getting slower as we go. Uh, oh, the button's not disabled. So I can click it multiple times still. Great. And now I get all of the data back. Um, well, let's put. Uh, Let's put a breakpoint in here and see what's happening. And this is where you, we get to deal with fun things in async code. OK, so let's just step through this. I'm going to F10 to step over. OK, so we disable the button. We clear the list box. We call the get async method. We assign the continuation. And then we immediately re-enable the button and exit the method. <laughs> OK, again, we don't have any blocking operations in this method, so it's just going to run start to finish. So we have the re-enable in the wrong spot in this case. We actually want to put the re-enabling inside the continuation. And so if we do that, now we'll get our expected result. Now this is, um, yeah, so I'll just show this. So now the button's disabled. Uh, I clicked on it, it's disabled. When the data comes back, it re-enables. And I'm not going to deal with handling uh, a finally block here because I'm about to add an exception to our code behind. So what happens if our asynchronous method fails, throws an exception? OK, so uh, let's throw a new not implemented exception. I'll say, oh, come on. Jeremy did not implement get async. We'll, we'll place blame here. OK. And let's just see how our code behaves without making any changes. So I'm going to start with task in this case. So I click the button. We wait our three seconds. And then we actually get an exception. Now, the exception isn't quite what we expect. It wasn't the not implemented exception. It's an aggregate exception. We'll spend some time talking about that. But notice where it stopped. It stopped on the task.result. So one of the fun things about multi-threading is that if an exception happens on a sub on a, an exception, let me restate this. An exception will stay on its own thread unless we go looking for it. <laughs> now, in this case, I'm trying to access the result property on a task which has an exception. And that's known as a task which is in the faulted state. So if a task is in the faulted state, the result property is invalid. It's not null. It's saying, you can't access this. And if we try to access it, it'll say, oh, well, here's the exception that came back. So the fun part about this is if I stop debugging and comment out the block of code that uses the result, so now my continuation is strictly re-enabling the button. If I click on the task button and wait, Come on. There we go. Click on the task button and wait the three seconds. Then what will happen is the button will re-enable. I don't have an exception here because it happened on a separate thread and I didn't go looking for it. So it's important when you're dealing with task manually to check for exceptions. Otherwise, you won't see them.
Now, again, if you try to use the result property on a faulted task, you will see it, but you can also explicitly check for them. So there is a uh, task has these is methods or is properties, I should say. There's an is canceled, is completed, is completed successfully, and is faulted. So we can check to see the state of the task. So we can say, well, if it's faulted, go ahead and do um, handle the exception. In this case, I'm going to do something you should never do, which is I'm going to do a message box and show a raw exception to the user. Never, ever do this. This is strictly for demo purposes. And it's to show you that we can get access to the actual exception for logging purposes. OK, so <laughs> the task also has an exception property on it. And uh, we'll just say get type on this, and we'll spit out the type of the exception to a message box. Uh oh, message box dot show. There we go. That's better. OK. And I've got a green squiggly here because I have nullable reference types turned on. I wish I had more time to explain exactly what's going on there. But I have to tell it, hey, I know exceptions is not null in this block. OK. Now, what about the rest of this? Well, I could put an else in, but you know, cancellation is also a possibility. So task is canceled. Um, handle cancellation which we don't have time for today. And I can say if task dot is completed, OK, here's a warning. Is completed does not mean what you think it means. It does not mean completed successfully. And there is a separate completed successfully. The reason I'm mentioning this is because is completed successfully only exists in .NET Core. Is completed ex successfully does not exist in .NET Framework. So if you're still using .NET Framework code, you're only going to have is completed. And all that means is the task is no longer running, whether it's success, fail, or faulted, or success, faulted, or canceled. So um, there is a task status you can use if you're using the .NET uh, Framework. And uh, you can check my online resources for that. <laughs> so yeah, that's fun. OK, so uh, we'll do that. and. Now, when we do this, we'll get a pop-up that shows our exception, but we still have a problem. Okay. Hurry up, computer. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. There we go. OK, so click the button. Uh, wait the three seconds. We still have to wait the three seconds because it, it throws. And this text is small, but if I zoom in, you can see it. It says, this is a system.aggregate exception. OK, let's talk about this aggregate exception. What is that? Well, an aggregate exception is basically a tree structure of exceptions. And that's because of how powerful and complicated task is. Because if I have a task that kicks off five child tasks that run at the same time, two of them complete successfully, three of them throw exceptions, which exception am I going to show you? <laughs> I can't show you the one that happens first, because first varies depending on what machine you're running on. And so the infrastructure says, well, I'm going to create this aggregate exception and show you all of them in a tree structure. So that doesn't help us much, because now how do I get to my actual exception? OK, I'm going to save you a lot of time. Do not build a tree parser. Trust me, I tried it. <laughs> Don't do it. But there is actually a method on task dot um, aggregate exception, which is a magical method called flatten. And what flatten will do is it'll take that tree structure of exceptions and go <laughs> and make it a single level. So if you say flatten and inner exceptions, then you're good to go. If I were to say just exception dot inner exceptions, those inner exceptions are also aggregates, so it's aggregates all the way down. <laughs> so this will flatten it so I can hopefully get to the real thing. Now I'm going to do something you really shouldn't do, and that is I'm going to for each over a collection of exceptions uh, and show you each thing in a list box. <laughs> okay. And then uh, I will change this to ex.getType, and then let's add the message. Um, X dot message. Okay. Slash and we'll add a line break there. Okay, now I have green squigglies up here because somewhere between the version of Visual Studio I had previously and the vision version of Visual Studio that I have now, um, the null um, the warnings that I have a null uh, possible possibility of a null object isn't working correctly for this scenario. So um, that's why those exist. And again, 
non-nullable reference type is something in C-sharp 8 that is a completely different topic. <laughs> OK, so now let's click on the button. We'll wait our three seconds. And then when we get our pop-up, we'll see it is the actual not implemented exception. Jeremy did not implement get async. And here's the thing. If there were more exceptions coming back, every time I click OK, I would get a new pop-up. So again, do not do this to your users. <laughs> But what I'm showing is that you do have access to the full exception, call stack, and everything. So you can run that through your standard logging system. So tell the user something went wrong and then run it through the log. OK, <laughs> I have five minutes left. And I'm going to show you what happens with a wait when we have an exception. OK, so let's, I shouldn't have stopped it. Let's run it again before I make any changes just to see what happens. OK. Click the fetch with a wait button. And then we'll see we get an exception. And let me zoom in. But notice this is the not implemented exception. OK, there's the, the screen share catching up. OK, so this is a not implemented exception. And that's good. So a wait actually unwinds that aggregate exception for you, which is awesome, uh, because it's like, well, you know what? There's generally one inner exception in these things. So I'm just going to unwrap this and give it to you. So uh, that's good. Now, notice also where it stopped. It stopped on the get async method. So this behaves very similar to non-asynchronous code, right? If, if we had a, a standard method that threw an exception, that's exactly where the debugger would stop. So again, when we use async await, it behaves very similar to how we're used to programming. And that's why it's awesome. Because I'm already in a try block. I can just add a catch and catch the exception that's coming back. And again, do something you should never do, which is display it to the user. Um, I'm just going to copy the message box show that I had above and paste it down into this catch block. And then when we run the application, we'll see that we have um, the exception message. Come on, you can do it. I know you can. I have faith in you. There we go. So I'll click the button and then wait the three seconds. And we get the pop-up. And let me zoom in on that. And we can see it is the not implemented exception. And the message, Jeremy did not implement get async. So Async await is beautiful because I just kind of program the way that I'm used to programming. And so people usually ask me, so Jeremy, you showed me both ways. What should I do? Use await whenever possible. Because again, it's very approachable code. And for me, this is 95% of what I need to do. Now, if I need to step outside of that, I need to chain tasks together or run things in parallel, then I use task manually. But now that I know what task is, it's not as scary as it used to be. And I actually have a completely separate talk I do on parallel programming now, because that's something that I find really fun and exciting. So you can see we haven't written a whole lot of code, but we have been able to uh, see that if we handle task manually, there's kind of a lot of things we need to check. <laughs> but if we use async and await, we kind of code pretty much the way we're used to coding. Let me just flip back to the slides, and we'll just summarize um, some of what we had here. So I did mention the is canceled, is completed, is faulted. And as a reminder, is completed means no longer running, not completed successfully. <laughs> and there is an is completed successfully that is available in all versions of .NET Core. It actually goes back to .NET Core 1.0, which makes me very upset, because why didn't they stick it in .NET Framework? Because <laughs> Anyway, another story. So it's available in all versions of .NET Core, as well as .NET Standard 2.1. It is not in .NET Standard 2.0 or .NET Framework. And .NET Standard 2.0 operates with .NET Framework, so that's why it's not in there. And of course, it will be in .NET 5, so that's coming in November. We can look forward to that. Now, if you are using .NET Framework, there is a status property. And you can check. You can see it has a canceled, faulted, and ran to completion. So we can do those same checks even if we don't have that is completed successfully uh, property. And then for exec exception handling, uh, aggregate exception is a tree structure. There's the magical flatten method. Don't build your own tree parser. And that flattens it to a single level. If I had more time, I would show you cancellation. Uh, and again, there are some online resources that show you the hurdles I 
kind of came across for that. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or hunt me down at the conference. And again, if you go to jeremybytes.com, you'll find the slides, the code samples, and I actually have, I think, a U yeah, actually, no, I have a YouTube series on this. So if you want some more information or to learn about delegates or Lambda expressions, that's all out there on my website. So I appreciate you spending your time with me. It looks like, oh, I nailed it. It is, OK, it's 9 AM where I am. I don't know what time it is where you are. I guess 12. So um, thank you very much for joining me. And enjoy the rest of your day.